Hey again, everyone. Today I want to talk to you about the ultimate goal of Poly 301. This is the thing that we've been working towards throughout the entire semester. This is the thing that um, ultimately is going to define your success in Poly 301. And it's hopefully something that you're going to be able to carry forward with you after the semester is over um, so that, that you're able to actually sort of convey the information that is most important to you to an audience. And of course, um, in all of those cases, I'm talking about the final project. That is Composition 7. So um, I provided for you the rubric for Composition 7 um, online. You can see that obviously the same place where all the other rubrics have been stored uh, in the Assignments tab. You'll see that the rubric very much follows along with pretty much all the other kinds of rubrics that we've been um, looking at throughout the semester. Really, it's again, it's everything together. So you'll see um, from the very beginning of the course to the very end of the course, um, essentially every single piece um, of, of the paper that we've been writing over the course of this entire semester is represented in Composition 7. From an introduction uh, to a literature review of the, the relevant literature on your subject, to a theory section that's pretty analogous to Composition 4, uh, to a method section which is pretty analogous to the writing um, that you did in Composition 5, to a discussion of quantitative results which is uh, analogous to some of the discussion that you did in uh, Composition 6 or that you're going to be doing. And then uh, finally, these last two pieces ultimately that uh, encompass the qualitative results section that we've been uh, talking about a little bit, um, you've been reading about in the book over the last couple of weeks, and then a discussion and conclusions section. So uh, one thing I want to show you, uh, in addition to my cat who has decided to join us for this particular discussion, um, is of course chapter 11 of the Forestier book. We're all aware of this, right? Chapter 11. Um, this is going to be the most important chapter for you um, for the purposes of this assignment. And I really recommend that you just take a moment to just read this chapter from cover to cover, from start to finish. It's going to provide you with a ton of really helpful, detailed information about how to write this research report um, in a way that uh, conforms to the proper stylistics, in a way that includes all the things that are relevant, and really importantly, that excludes things that we do not need in this assignment. Um, because, you know, as you recall from some of these compositions before, you know, your lit review composition, you were writing things about, for example, the... Um, the credibility of some of these sources, um, statements of credibility, things like um, impact factors of journal articles, those do not belong in a published research report. You'll never see that in a, in a research report, in an article uh, that's published in a journal. Right, um, your um, method section. Right, there may be certain components of that that were for illustrative purposes that you don't want to include. Other things you want to um, bolster, you want to fortify. Tell me even more about some of these um, design decisions that you made. For example, if you made recodes, for example. Um, other other aspects of this. Right, the introduction now has has added components. For the first time, we're going to be um, foreshadowing some of our conclusions in the introduction. Uh, we're going to, going to uh, make sure that the audience has a, a good awareness of what we're planning on doing throughout the rest of the paper. And we're actually going to be spilling the beans a little bit in that introduction, uh, providing a, a, an overview of the results at the very beginning of the paper. So we're not holding anything back. We're not keeping anything secret from our audience. We're trying to tell them what we found so that they're able to ex uh, expect, ultimately, um, to see that, that broader discussion later in the paper. So if you look through, obviously the formatting, the structure, stylistics are exactly the same. Uh, the introduction though, as I've just mo uh, mentioned a moment ago, um, we're going to have some stuff that's from composition one, right? A statement of the research question, the topic, and the, some background that um, draws people in and, and explains the relevance of the research. And then of course this uh, second set of discussions in which you preview the methods and data and you provide a summary statement. The literature review, of course, we're well versed in the literature review so far. Uh, we know how to provide this thematic review that includes at least six tier one sources. And of course, we also have the ability to, to create a gap statement where we identify sort of how our research, how our specific approach, either methodological, theoretical, um, whatever, is, is um, ultimately uh, serving to advance that literature. Then, of course, the theory section. Um, this is, again, analogous to Composition 4. Uh, I'm hoping to, again, see that like paragraph or page or so um, that is the why statement, why it is that there's a relationship between the IV and the DV concept. Um, I really recommend that you go back into that and um, try, to, try to shore up that statement because it's really, really important uh, for the final project. 
And then, of course, this possible source of spuriousness stuff. Um, it would be really great in this discussion if you would uh, be able to um, foreshadow some of the variables that you're including in your study as third variables. I've often in the, the videos called them CVs or control variables. Uh, whatever these variables are that you think are important to include, um, you might want to tell me a little bit about why you think those are important in this section. Of course, uh, that's the end of the front end of the paper. And in this second part, we're gonna be moving from the front end or the sort of conceptual world into the, the methodological world or in the world of measurement. And so in this, in this set of uh, discussions, of course, in the methods analogous to composition five, you're gonna be telling me about where you got your data from, right? Parenthetically citing those data sets. If you have data that's coming from certain places like say surveys or you know, the World Bank or you know, state level estimates of something or another, right? Um, and then you want to dive into those measures. You want to talk about what measures did you use in the quantitative um, aspects of the study? What different tools also did you use to do that analysis? So this is where you should refer back to that PDF that's in um, the uh, module four folder, I believe, uh, which is called essentially like bivariate statistics, like how to choose them, right? I forget exactly the name of that PDF, but you want to go back and look in, look in there for the, the guide essentially uh, for which statistics, which bivariate statistics, which graphics, are most appropriate for your for your um, methods and just mention at that point like I'm going you know like uh, a scatter plot and um, you know a correlation coefficient are used to report bivariate relationships and linear multiple linear regression is used uh, to analyze the uh, effects of the independent variable on the dependent variable in the presence of possibly confounding variables um, so you just want to mention this also that you're going to do this this stuff whichever they are, and then that you're going to use linear regression. So everyone, of course, since we're all doing linear regression, should mention linear regression in this section. Then finally, this is something that's new, that's not part of Composition 5. You're going to want to introduce those two qualitative case studies and tell me a little bit about um, sort of what you did, or just foreshadow. You don't need to tell me everything, but just say, you know, archival research was used, you know, our secondary source materials were reviewed, process tracing was employed to identify um, the uh, uh, relationship between the IV and DV in further depth. Um, also remembering that, again, with this um, uh, uh, qualitative analysis, if you are doing a quantitative analysis in the first part that used a survey, in this case, your two cases are actually just gonna be people. So you're gonna perform these brief interviews that could be un or semi-structured, refer back to the Forestier book for more information about how to conduct these interviews, talk to a couple of people you know briefly, um, and try to see if you can tease out that relationship between the IV and DV um, in that conversation. So it could be any one of these different, different um, uh, approaches to research, either sort of through process tracing that comes from secondary or primary source research, or interviewing, um, if you're working with survey data up, up above, uh, that will flesh out this uh, qualitative set of data. So again, in this section, this method section, you're not doing any of those analyses, right? All you're doing is telling me, as the, as the reader, you're foreshadowing, you're explaining to me how you did all the stuff that you did, so that later when you get into those results, you don't have to tell me about all those bells and whistles. You can just get right into the results and tell me what you found. And so that is exactly what we're gonna do in this part. This is analogous to composition six, the quantitative results. In fact, this is gonna be something that's very close to composition six. Um, some of this stuff comes directly from the composition six rubric. The first one is that bivariate analysis where you're looking at the IV and DV in isolation, just, the, just that one link, and maybe one other relationship, for example, a control variable in your DV to see if that control variable matters, right? And then graphics that are appropriate, so at least two graphs are going to be placed into the text or pasted in uh, in this section, and then some statistical tests that you're going to interpret, including a p-value and some sort of uh, measure of um, direction and strength. And so again, th this uh, uh, PDF that I've been talking about, Tools for Assessing Bivariate Relationships, that's going to be the one that you want to take a look at. And of course, in this discussion, you can see this is three to four pages, so it's not just like, here's some graphs, I found a p-value. You want to tell me about what these things mean, right? What are your impressions of the relationships? Are these strong relationships? Are they weak relationships? Is this surprising? Like, what do these, what do these bivariate analyses tell you um, from an initial perspective about the, uh, the relationships between the IV and the DV. Finally, in this section, you'll be performing regression. And of course, you have some uh, experience with that in module six or in uh, uh, composition six. You'll be creating and reporting what I call a full model. A lot of people have had some questions about full model. By that, I essentially mean you're going to include all relevant predictors 
are all relevant variables in this model. So it's not going to be a model with just the IV in there. It's not going to be a model with just one variable or two variables. You're going to try to have as many variables that you think are relevant as possible in this model. So that's going to be, you don't need to do the thing where you build up from a zero model to a one to a two to a three. Um, you can really just report and interpret this full model because that's of course going to be the most theoretically relevant model for your, um, for your interpretations. And you're going to write things like this. So of course this is second nature to you as you've completed composition six. But remember this, that uh, my feedback to composition six, you're gonna wanna make sure that you pay close attention to that because I might have some comments on your regression analysis interpretation. And then finally, I want you to comment holistically, kind of like in quiz nine, on like the big takeaways from this model. What seem to be the most important predictors of the outcome? What seem to be the least important predictors? Is the model fit good or is it weak, right? What, what does all this mean, ultimately? Does this, does this help us learn something about the relationship? Or are there uh, you know, surprising, unexpected um, uh, findings that come out of the, the qual quantitative relationships that you did not expect? Now we get to the stuff that's truly and fully new, the qualitative analysis, okay? So again, you're gonna be using some of the, the tools that I gave you in the previous modules to carefully select two cases. So if your population is states, you're gonna select two states. If your population is countries, selecting two countries. If your population is individuals who have been surveyed, then you're gonna perform interviews of two people that you know. Um, and so you wanna select these cases. I don't really care exactly which cases you select as long as they're considered high impact. So either they're really high on the IV and the DV or they're low on the IV and the DV, or they're like these weird outliers that seem to be just, just out, of, out of the uh, trend um, for whatever reason, right? Interesting cases. And then you're gonna perform this stuff, right? Uh, uh, either an, uh, 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 an interview or again, this uh, process tracing primary and secondary source research on the two uh, cases. And you're gonna write that up. You're gonna tell me what you found, whether or not it helps to support your theory, whether or not it breaks your theory apart, whether or not it shows maybe that there are other variables at play here that you hadn't thought about before, right? Um, one thing I want to mention here is that oftentimes students come at this um, and they think to themselves, oh, I, I need to prove my theory. I need to, to, against all odds, tell you that my theory is right. But we're doing science, right? Which means that we're not motivated, right? We're, we're uh, completely, um, you know, dispassionate uh, observers of this process. And so if our theory is being challenged by stuff that we're finding in these case studies that don't seem to line up with our initial expectations, we want to say that. We want to say things like, surprisingly, like these cases seem to not work the way that I thought the world worked, right? When I gave my why statement up here in the theory section, it turns out that the why statement is actually not giving us the true picture of the world based on the two cases that I uh, analyze. My surveyed individuals are talking about stuff that I, I didn't expect, right? My um, you know deep dive into the cases showed that this other kind of uh, feature was really what's driving uh, what's going on. It's very okay to, to, to sort of revise your assumptions in this section. That's what qualitative analysis is all about. It's about digging into this stuff and either finding these links that we expected or uncovering new links that we didn't expect. And that's really, really um, one of the strengths of qualitative analysis is it allows us to get this rich. And we talked about um, this early in the semester, right? Um, instead of this, this, this uh, tall kind of data, we get, we get thick description or rich description of the cases that we, that we would not otherwise um, understand if we had only performed the regression analysis. That's why we're doing this. And then finally, again, if we go back to the forest year book, you'll see a lot more about the discussion of how to do these conclusions. Um, in the conclusions, you're doing essentially three major things. One is you're recapping the key findings of the study. By that, I don't mean repeat everything you wrote earlier. I'm saying, think about this. If you were to tell this to a person, say that you're you know, uh, sitting on a, an airplane with somebody and you know, you've got 45 minutes left in the flight and somebody says, oh, I see you're working on a paper what do you find, right? What did you find in this paper? Um, tell me as if you were explaining this to somebody who had no knowledge of research at all, um, what this means. So from a broad, non-technical perspective. Then second, you're gonna continue this discussion of whether or not this study's results squared with expectations. Did you find what you expected to find? Oftentimes, you may, you may find something else and that's very okay, right? What I wanna know is why? What is, what is the reason behind this? What, what is your hunch? This is where you get to put your sort of detective cap back on and think to yourself, what's really going on here? 
And it may be that your data collection or your methods were limited in certain ways. There were kinds of uh, uh, variables that you couldn't collect, or it was really hard to get certain years, or there were other cases that were missing, or whatever, right? Maybe you had to drop out a lot of rows from your data. Maybe it was too small of an N. Maybe there were some technical reasons why this, this uh, uh, result didn't pan out the way you expected. Maybe the direction of the relationship was different, or it wasn't weak, or it was weak, or it wasn't strong. Maybe you might say, look, I mean, I actually feel like there's not much wrong with the way that I did this study, that there are a uh, few sort of hurdles to this, um, to this interpretation. Maybe this really does tell us that in this new case that I'm studying, um, the existing theory, the existing why statement doesn't actually hold up. Um, so again, you can really think, think critically about what, what this study means and whether or not this will cause us to have to go back to the drawing board and think more carefully about the why statement, or whether this will mean that future researchers will have to go back to the methodological drawing board and think about better ways to do, you know, for example, operationalization. And then finally, I want you to talk again, kind of leading up to this, to this thing, right? Like, how could, how could future researchers do this study even better? Um, that's a really important statement because it's, again, it's a cue to other researchers that they might be able to do this um, study in a way that allows them to, uh, to verify these relationships in, in an even more robust fashion. So um, that's really, you know, the conclusions, a lot of people think about this as like, oh, I've, I reached the end, I can just sort of BS a couple of sentences here. The conclusions are actually one of the most important pieces of a, of a research paper. Um, and then lastly, we have the Works Cited page. We know about this, right? <laughs> We're Chicago style, we are, have already done this many, many times, and so this should not be a problem for any of us. Okay, lastly, I just want to point you to at least one paper. This is something that will be in the uh, module folder. This is a paper that was referenced in the Forest Year book. It's a paper by Jonathan Kreekhaus, uh, Byung-Wan Son, Nisha Mukherjee Bellinger, and Jason Wells that was published in the Journal of Politics, which is a very high-level journal, um, in, in uh, 2013. And this paper is about economic inequality and democratic support. So kind of interesting, right? This is uh, actually a paper that may be quite close to some of your research topics. Does economic inequality influence citizens' support for democracy? There's a, a research question right there, isn't it? Uh, really helpful um, to have put this out here um, so, uh, so, so uh, nicely in this, what we call abstract. Uh, but if you read through this paper, you will see that the introduction, the, um, there's a little bit of a research, of a literature review sort of baked into this introduction, so it's not quite in the format that we want, but there's a nice why statement, a pretty strong theory here, right? Distinct theoretical perspectives that lead to some hypotheses, right? Four hypotheses, in fact. We only need one main hypothesis. Uh, we don't need four. Don't worry about that. Obviously, this published paper in a high-level journal has got a little more going on than the average 301 paper, um, but really, like, this is, this is quite, like, close to the, the stuff that we want here, right? This theory section goes on a little bit longer here because they advance these multiple hypotheses, but you can see that this is uh, more or less the design. Then they move into the research design and measurement stage where they say things like, testing these hypotheses requires combining typical data sets in the survey literature with national data sets. And so they talk about the kinds of um, uh, methods that they're using. They're using multi-level modeling, which is a special kind of regression. Um, and they talk a little bit about measurement, right? Where did they get their data? Oh, look, we know about this, right? They get their data from the World Value Survey. They cite the World Value Survey here. They talk all about the different countries that are included. Uh, they talk about some of the, in these footnotes, they talk about some of the technical details here. But then they get into a discussion of, lo and behold, the dependent variable. Right? They talk about what they're measuring. They use democratic support. This, uh, this variable that some of you have maybe even been using in your study. They talk about the independent variables. They talk about how they're measured, right? Inequality, the Gini coefficients. Some of you are uh, uh, well, uh, ver well versed in the Gini coefficient. They talk more about some of these other variables in here. So like, I mean, this is actually, uh, again, a, published in a very high level journal, but really quite um, analogous maybe to some of the stuff um, that we'd see in a good Poly301 project. We see control variables here, additional controls. They've got a lot, we only need a couple. And then finally they jump into the results. And you'll see here, like look at this, this is great. They start with a bivariate bivariate relationship. They show a scatter plot. Um, this one is made in Stata. And look at that, they report an R square and a p-value and the n, right? This is exactly the kind of thing we want in our in our paper. And then as they go on, they do a couple of things, but uh, really I want to point you to table one which is a regression table. 
they've got six models with a lot of variables, right? You might see your, your models are a lot smaller than this, but of course, again, this is high level political science research, large models um, in order to satisfy those cranky reviewers, right? Um, they've got six different models where they're building in some of this stuff, or they've got nested models, kind of like the way that I've shown you how to do it. And finally, their full model in model six builds in pretty much all of these variables. Um, as you can see, they've got a lot of data. They've got 77,000 cases. They've got uh, a lot of countries in here. They've actually got sort of um, a mixed model where they're doing uh, regression on multiple countries and multiple people within countries. So it's a very complicated sort of setup. But altogether, right, this is, this is a, a regression table, it's similar to the kind of thing that you're going to put in here. They have this really nice interpretation of the substantive significance of their relationship. Uh, they actually even build a table of that. We don't need to do anything like that. Um, but they're talking about, right, they're doing these nice, like, statistical interpretations, just like we've learned how to write. And then they're going on, they're talking more about this. Uh, they don't have a qualitative section here. So that's one thing that our paper is going to have that these people don't, partially because in most of these journal articles, no one's doing mixed methods research because it's obviously more challenging. Uh, and it it's, uh, makes papers longer where uh, a lot of journals have uh, pretty strong space constraints. And then they've got this nice conclusion section where they talk again about uh, what this means for their theories, what this means for uh, the next uh, research, right? They say considerable work remains to be done, kind of like we were talking about. Uh, a lot of stuff uh, in the conclusion that, uh, that we would want to include in our conclusions as well. So all that being said, this is a really helpful uh, paper. It's not perfect in terms of uh, an example, but at least gets us thinking a little bit about the writing style and about some of the way that we might present some of our coefficients and some of the quantitative results at least. So I encourage you to look at that one. I'm also gonna be live streaming my own uh, paper progress on paper seven, and we'll get, get a chance to see me sort of stumble my way through uh, the quantitative and qualitative sections of those, um, of those results. So stay tuned. Uh, in the next few weeks, right, we have until um, sort of mid-May, actually, to complete this, this project. So uh, over the next few weeks, I encourage you to be working on this step by step. Um, every week, you know, every Tuesday and Thursday, try to put away a little bit of time to work on this project, because uh, I really encourage you, do not wait until the last minute. It's going to be a disaster if you wait until, you know, May 10th to work on this project. Um, start talking to me now. Uh, consult some of these examples, and let's try to make this paper as, as good as it can possibly be. I appreciate all of you hanging in there. It's obviously every time we do a poly um, three or one class, I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult uh, class. It's a huge time investment. And I've been really, really impressed by all of the hard work that you all have done in this class so far. So good luck with this uh, project. Good luck um, with the final uh, uh, paper and stay tuned for more information about um, how you might further strengthen that paper and make it as good as it could possibly be. So long.